planet is teeming with life. There are millions of different species of plants and animals. One of these species among all the rest is us, humans. The human body is made up of bones, muscles, blood vessels, various organs, and a relatively large brain. Our species is a relatively new creation, barely 200,000 years old. But we are one link in the chain of life on Earth, and that began a whole 3.8 billion years ago with single-celled life forms in the ocean. One can look at it like a tree, where all the species are formed from the same seed. Here, among other things, we find bacteria and plants. In our particular part of the tree, you'll find fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals such as wolves, monkeys, and also us, humans. It's called evolution. This means that all the parts that make up our bodies we've inherited from earlier species. And to understand evolution is to understand ourselves. The study of evolution is the study of life itself on Earth. And here, Swedish universities are on the leading edge. Supermicroscopes reveal the human body's earliest predecessor. DNA sequencing maps out how evolution creates new species of birds and snails. And supercomputers help scientists to understand billions of years of evolution. One of the world's foremost centers for evolutionary research is in Uppsala. Per Alberg is on the hunt. He's chasing down our specimens. The goal is ambitious, to understand why we humans look like we do. Fundamentally, what I want to understand is how our body plan has been assembled by evolution. If you look at our own human anatomy, if you look yourself in the mirror, you carry the heritage of more than 500 million years of vertebrate evolution. And I want to understand how this has come to be. What were the steps by which our own body plan was assembled? The word evolution was made famous by Charles Darwin in the 1800s. And when one talks about evolutionary research, it is often thought that it looks like this, with fossils and skeletons. But today, new technology is giving way to entirely new possibilities, even with older finds. This is a piece of a jaw of a very early bony fish, Andrew Lepis, from Gotland in Sweden. It's about 424 million years old, and it's really close to the common ancestry, not only of all living bony fish, but also of us land vertebrates. This is something not far off, a very distant ancestor of ours. It doesn't look like much, does it? But the detailed structure of this jaw is extremely well preserved, and with the right technique, you can pull out astonishing information out of this. Pear brought this small fish jaw to his synchrotron light facility. This functions as a huge microscope and provides extremely detailed X-ray images. Oh, what we got? Oh. The resolution of our scan is about one thousandth of a millimeter, and we can see in perfect detail all the internal structures in this jaw in three dimensions. And we can model them out in three dimensions, something that really no other research group has done so far. 3D models of the fish jawbone reveal evidence of old tooth roots in several layers. The fish have lost their teeth by means of withering roots, similarly as us when we lose our baby teeth. Here, researchers have discovered the earliest example of a jaw that functions just like our own. It forms a significant part in the jigsaw puzzle of how did the human body plan come to be assembled by evolution.
But to understand what is affecting the puzzle, Pear's team needs to go further. They now look to our genes. Which genes control how parts of the body develop? And they've gotten help from a common aquarium fish, the zebrafish. Hello, hey, How's it going? Yeah, it's good. good. All right, what have we got? Despite the fact that you're looking at a little stripy fish like this, they are actually anatomically very like human beings. The basic body plan is exactly the same as ours. They actually have fluorescently labeled muscles. Oh, nice, very good. And you can actually see it in the daylight. Oh, they so do. So it's know. actually nice. very interesting. They're a really handy model for understanding how the vertebrate body plan has been put together and how it is regulated genetically. Have you got anything under the microscope? Or? Yes, I have some embryos. Okay, there. good. Let's kind of look. Different age. Yeah. Here, with the help of something called the CRISPR technique, they can turn off genes in DNA to see what effect will result in the body's development. These fish that are naturally transparent are genetically modified so that certain tissues fluoresce under ultraviolet light. Then, under the microscope, they can precisely follow the development of those parts of the body being studied. Pear brings this knowledge back to their fossils, all together providing a completely new understanding of our own body's development. One thing that we do in my research group is we try to pull together these different strands of data into a sort of overview of how evolution in backboned animals has worked. Humans are just one of the various species that evolution research is interested in. Here at the research station Tuvatorp, they are studying two types of crows. The gray crow commonly found in Sweden and the black one, which is found in southern Europe. Although they look different, they still belong to the same species. The question is, for how much longer? Oh, that, that's it, then, Hulk. The crows are a part of Hans Ellegren's research. He is seeking the answer to one of evolution's great mysteries, how new species come into being. I'm very interested to try to understand how come it that we see such great biodiversity around us. All the animals, some plants, some birds, and other life forms, how has that diversity evolved? That's something that really is of interest to me. When new species form, there are two forces at work. One is mutation. When sudden changes can occur in the cell's DNA, mutations during cell division. This happens occasionally, but if the mutated gene is going to be important, it has to provide a benefit. For example, for the animal with the mutation, it may be easier to survive or reproduce. The unfavorable mutations disappear. It's called natural selection. The crows have a mutation that changed their color and that makes them reluctant to mate with the others anymore. Hans knows that this phenomenon can result in two different species, because he has already had a close look at another common bird, the flycatcher. This is the pied flycatcher, a female and a male. And there is the collar flycatcher. Flycatchers already exist today as different species, but at one time they were only a single species, which were divided during the Ice Age. After that, the flycatchers developed in different directions, into the pied flycatcher and the collared flycatcher. As the name implies, the collared flycatcher has a neck collar. It's white all the way around the neck, while the pied flycatcher is entirely black in the neck. In addition to the different appearance of the birds, they also developed a critical difference that made them into two different species. If they intermate, they can no longer have viable offspring. Hans then wanted to find out what it was in the bird's DNA that was responsible for this. To search for the answer, Hans made use of the technology here at the SciLife Laboratory in Uppsala. 
It is here that his research team would be the first in history to map a bird's entire genome. This is called DNA sequencing. First, the DNA samples are prepared in several steps, after which they are fastened to sample plates. The plates are then put into a machine where the actual sequencing takes place over a period of three to four days. The result is very small pieces of the DNA code. Hans sees these building blocks as letters, and the flycatcher's entire DNA consists of over a billion. When all the building blocks are in the right place, it can reveal how the bird species differ. Here's an example where we have aligned the DNA sequence of several collar flycatchers and several pied flycatchers. At this position, all pied flycatchers have a blue variant, while all collar flycatchers had the green variant. A major aim of our research has been to find those genetic differences that reasonably have to occur between these two close related species. But which gene is the key that turned the flycatcher into different species? When we began this research, we had this idea that we would find a single gene that could explain why did they get sterile offspring. To be honest, we have not succeeded with that. And the reason for that appears to be that there is not a single gene that affects this sterility. Rather, the genetic background to sterility is probably very complex. This research on speciation plays an important part in understanding the diversity of life on Earth, where even a small mutation can be important, as with the crow's shift in color, for this can lead to a completely new species. And diversity of species is what makes it possible for life to continue in different types of habitats. Research about evolution is critical for our understanding of biodiversity. We need to understand that to be able to live together with the nature and to be able to preserve the diversity. Kerstin Johannesson is on her way out to Kosterhavet's Marine National Park on the west coast of Sweden. She also studies the development of species, but she has looked more closely at the second part, the natural selection part, and these small rocky islands have turned out to be a gold mine for researchers. Kerstin Johannesson is looking for two snails of the same species, which are living in two different places among the rocks and thus have adapted in various ways to their harsh environments. The first wave snail is an expert at living on the ends of the bare, inaccessible cliffs. Here, the waves are constantly pounding the rocks, and survival is a matter of holding on tightly. Yeah, so here we have the snails that are typical of the wave-exposed cliffs, and uh, these are small, tiny. Being small is good to be in the crevice, to get uh, shelter from the waves. The second form of the same snail, the crab snail, lives only 20 meters away, but in among the stones, where the waters are calmer, but other hazards lurk. These are the crab snails that we uh, got here in the boulder area. <clears throat> and as you can see, they are big and they are really robust. And they have a good reason for this, because in this area is really a lot of predation from crabs. So the crabs are here all the summer and autumn, and they tend to crush the shell and eat the soft parts of the snails. Because of the unique properties of the two locations, only those snails that have adapted to that environment can survive. It is natural selection which is about to create two different species, and it is one that will not only affect the snail's appearance. Now we should try to see if these snails have different personalities. I mean, more or less immediately, I can see that the wave snails, they start to come out of their shells, and they try now to attach to the substrate and uh, get a good grip on the rocks. 
not to be uh, washed away by the waves simply. While the crab snails, they are really very careful because if there's a crab around, they will be much more protected inside their shell than if they are out crawling around. The research group has collected snails from many different islands, and the development into wave snails and crab snails has been everywhere. This is natural selection's hard and fast law. It looks as if the snails traveled on the exact same evolutionary journey, which should be reflected in the changes to the genes. But there is something that doesn't add up. And then if we look for the differences in one island, we may see that there are like 80 different genes that are different. And then we go to another island, but they may not be the same actually. So sometimes we only find that they share a few, a handful of genes where they differ. And then the rest of them are unique to the different islands. Despite the fact that the snails have evolved in the same way, they have not, as previously thought, used the same genes. And that, we think, is a sign of that evolution has many potential roads to get to the same final goal. Despite the fact that natural selection has resulted in snails from various islands looking alike, now the genes are showing something surprising, that their diversity is still very high and life can take many different routes. Evolution research is not just about studying life history. We can also learn from nature's evolution in order to create new medications and greener industries. This is the goal of Lynn Kammerling's research. She is looking at a crucial component of all life on Earth, enzymes. My dream is that in the best of worlds, we can use computers to easily design enzymes to do completely new reactions, maybe reactions we've never even seen before in nature. And that to do this is as easy as the click of a mouse. Deep in our cells, chemical reactions constantly take place in which various substances react to one another to form new substances. However, the reactions themselves are altogether too slow. They need to be accelerated, and that's what enzymes do. The enzymes are molecules that embrace substances and can increase the speed of a reaction by several million times. It's called catalysis. And for each reaction in nature, evolution has developed enzymes. Hi guys, how are you? Hello. It's good to see you again. So I hope you're having a good week. Lynn now wants to learn how nature is proceeding with this. But she must first piece together the billion-year-old model from which many newer enzymes have been developed. And through advanced computer simulations, Lynn's team succeeds. So we almost have basic, or actually we have a working model now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just need to uh, test the model. Here one can see the old and new enzymes next to each other. They may look the same, but looks are deceiving. You can see how it moves in different ways, especially in these flexible regions. And this difference, this balance between flexibility and rigidity, this basically determines what an enzyme is able to do. Evolution has made the newer green enzyme to become stiffer, indicating that it specializes in a particular chemical reaction. It has taken billions of years, but now researchers can follow the process in a short time with the help of a supercomputer. And Lynn is fortunate. Only a few hundred meters from her office in the basement of the Angstrom laboratory is Upmax. Upmax is a supercomputer with the capacity of 10,000 ordinary computers. What took billions of years in nature 
Now, the supercomputer can calculate out in just a few days. The possibilities here have attracted many promising young researchers. And Lin's team includes talent from all over the world. And for me, it's really important to bring the world to Uppsala. When you come from different cultures, you have different ways of thinking. You have different ways of solving problems. Lin's team is now studying an enzyme that has surprised scientists. Okay, so if we look now. This is an enzyme that's capable of breaking down both nerve gases and pesticides. Pesticides are toxic compounds used in agriculture, especially in developing countries, but they are also toxic to humans. It affects several hundred thousand people annually, and it's one of the leading causes of death by poisoning worldwide. So if we can find new treatments to deal with acute pesticide poisoning, we will literally be saving lives. Nature has already managed to develop enzymes that break down pesticides. Lin's team now wants to learn this process in order to improve the enzyme so it can function as an antidote for people. What we're trying to do is to train this enzyme to be much faster. Because if it gets much faster, this is an enzyme you could inject into people as a treatment for nerve gas poisoning, for pesticide spills. In the future, Lin believes that we will be able to design several custom enzymes, which, among other things, will replace several hazardous chemicals in industry. Current industrial approaches often use heavily toxic chemicals, expensive chemicals. Enzymes can be used again and again and again. They don't destroy the environment, they're green. They just need to learn how to do the right reactions. And sustainability is crucial if we're going to have a future on this little planet. Evolution is happening all the time, all over our planet. In order to protect the diversity of life against environmental threats, the knowledge of how evolution works is a fundamental part. Scientists are learning more and more about how species evolve, why humans look the way we do, and how evolution can help us to develop new medicines and greener industry. It is all about understanding the history of life, and perhaps even more importantly, understanding the future of life.